John from Heroes and Legends, and we have more Hour of Devastation previews to look at. Some interesting cards again today. Now, previews are starting to wind down. You'll notice that in today's batch of cards. We get a lot more of like the limited cards, a lot of uncommons today, and that's kind of to be expected. Tomorrow's the last day we'll do an official preview video, and tomorrow's video, of course, will recap everything that happens within the next 24 hours. But Friday, we're actually going to have the whole set drop for the rest of the set, and we'll begin our full set review starting with the white cards. Quickly, before we get started with today's cards, though, if you check out the description below, you'll find a couple ways to help support us. One of which is our Amazon affiliate store. Any purchases you make via the links there, a small percentage will come back to help us out. Secondly, you'll also find our Patreon page linked below, too. With that out of the way, let's get into the cards. Hour of Eternity. Three blue, two X, sorcery rare, XL, X target, creature cards from your graveyard. For each card, XL this way, create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 4 4 black zombie. First off, the art does look incredible. I bet this is amazing in foil. The card itself, I'm not super excited about. The casting cost is just asking too much, I think, for the ability. Three blue and then a double X. I mean, eternalizing something in my graveyard is very exciting. There's a lot of really amazing targets out there. There's unblockable creatures. There's creatures with all sorts of enter the battlefield effects. Like, there's a lot of things that make this type of card appealing. But five mana, three of it being blue, I think that kind of keeps it out of standard for the most part, I'd have to say. Now, limited purposes, draft sealed, could be a good card for you there. As long as you felt comfortable with the triple blue some decks can swing it just fine some may have an issue if you're going a little greedy on your colors then maybe this will be too difficult to cast but if you are playing two colors maybe just slight splash for a third this is still very playable and you might be able to get some good combinations going between this and some of the cards in your graveyard so for those purposes i do like it in draft i'm not necessarily first picking this or anything but if i can pick it up in the middle of the pack it might be a decent pickup for some archetypes Ominous Sphinx. This one's two blue and three. It's an uncommon Sphinx, four, four with flying. Whenever you cycle or discard a card, target creature and opponent controls gets minus two, minus so until end of turn. Well, again, not a card that's going to light up standard or anything like that. It's not really doing enough for its casting cost of five. There's just better things out there. Now, limited purposes again. Yeah, very playable. Maybe even a high pick. When it comes to both sealed and draft, I like playing four, four flyers for five. They can do a lot of work for you. This one has an ability tacked on as well. And if I do happen to cycle or discard, wonderful. Like, it's just bonus on top. But more importantly, having this on the battlefield may make your opponent reconsider some attacks. And blue, a lot of times, likes to slow down the game. This does help you slow down the game in certain circumstances, but it also can go on the offensive in others. So yeah, very good for limited purposes, no doubt. All right, next card comes to us from a French language spoiler. It's a Vizier of the Anointed. It's a blue and three human cleric, another uncommon two, four. When this enters the battlefield, search your library for a card with Embalm or Eternalize, put it into your graveyard, then shuffle. Whenever you Eternalize or Embalm, draw a card. Well, the most exciting part for me is that last part, whenever you Eternalize or Embalm, draw a card. That feels pretty good, especially on a two, four body for four. Again, I'm really thinking about sealed and draft here more than anything. I don't think it's quite doing enough for you for the standard environment, but it is interesting, again, for any deck that is trying to maybe draft all the Embalm and Eternalize that comes their way, Or right? hate This is a nice support card for that type of archetype, and that's where I think it will truly excel. Good in both the sealed and draft formats, and again, even if you get yourself a 2-4 for 4 with some potential upside later in the game, they can still be just fine and limited, especially if you're trying to grind the game down a little bit. Rizikat's right. Two black and three. It's a sorcery. Uncommon. Search your library for a card, put in your hand, shuffle, and it can cycle for a black. Well, I don't know. This one, tutor effects are great. I love tutor effects. This is a more expensive diabolic tutor, but the reason you're paying that extra mana is simply because it gives you the option to cycle it away. Here's what's a little bit disturbing about that, though, for me, is I don't want to cycle away my tutor spell. Like, tutor spells are great, and if you can get to the point you can play this, you're going to be able to pull whatever card you want out of your library. Now, it's nice to have the cycling option, and if I do get stuck on lands or something, then all right, I kind of have to cycle it, and at least it only costs one to cycle. It is one on color, but it's just one. That's kind of nice. 
But again, it just feels too slow for what it's trying to do. I mean, five casting cost tutors, they can get there. And we saw the one for Magic Origins, Dark Petition, that does show up in Legacy and Modern, like Storm style decks. But that's because its secondary ability was interesting. It had spell mastery for three black mana when he cast it. So as long as you had two spells or two instances or sorceries already in your graveyard, then you played it, you tutored, and you dark ritual too. Like that's interesting. That can be useful. Just tacking the cycling on here isn't quite the same thing. As far as limited purposes, though, it's certainly playable. Like, I play Diabolic Tutor all the time and, like, Draft and Sealed, and I'm pretty happy with it. I think I'd be pretty happy with this one, too. Again, it's not a real high pick for me, maybe not, like, a first or second pick. But again, middle of the pack, I'd be happy to pick it up if I'm in black. Hazaret's Undying Fury. This one costs two red and four. It's a sorcery rare. Shuffle your library, then exile the top four cards. You may cast any number of non-land cards with converted mana cost five or less from among them without paying their mana cost. Lands you control don't untap it during your next untap step. Well, I really liked all the cards in this cycle that they've revealed up until now. This one is just too high variance for me. It's costing six. That drawback starts to look really bad when you're spending six on the spell. Like, I can get by with that drawback when it's cards that cost three or two. But when you start talking about six, and you know, lands aren't going to untap next time around, yikes. That's scary. And the fact that I can't even do anything to set this thing up because I have to shuffle my library first off, right? When I play it, it's completely random what you're going to hit. The variance is just too high for this card for me. It definitely won't see play in any sort of competitive format because it lacks the consistency that it would need there. Is this playable in the limited environments? The gambler in me kind of wants to play it, but I don't think it's a smart move. If I have something at six that's just going to always be good and not maybe sometimes almost be good, then I think I'm playing that. Like a six casting cost, say like 6-6 six, six Trampler, for example, or something like that. That feels like a 6 casting cost card. You know what that's going to do. It's not always going to save you, but it's good. It's going to impact the board state. This sometimes will be much better than that 6-6 six, six Trampler. Other times, it will be worse than that 6-6 six, six Trampler. But you just don't know, and I don't like cards that are that high variance, quite honestly. So as much as the gambler in me would like to say, oh, maybe I'll pick it up and draft at the end of a pack and play it, or I'll throw it in my sealed pool or in my sealed deck, honestly, I don't think I'd go there unless I was really desperate for a playable. Consigned to Oblivion. Now this one I like. It's a blue and one. It's another uncommon instant return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. The Oblivion side is a black and four sorcery with aftermath target opponent discards two cards. So that aftermath portion Oblivion feels a little overcosted, but that consign portion is really good. Return target non-land permanent to owner's hand at instant speed. Very versatile. Takes care of a lot of things going on. Nice tempo play. Sometimes lets you save your own stuff or exploit like an entrance battlefield effect. Just does a lot of stuff for you and it's real cheap. And the Oblivion side, like if you're playing blue and you're playing with Torrential Gearhawks or something, well, this card just interacts really well with that card. So in general, just feels good to me. I really like this one, actually. I could see it seeing a fair amount of standard play in the right deck, the control decks, of course. Any deck that's playing Gearhawk could be interested in something like this in general. But yeah, I like it, and it's definitely good in Limited to be happy to play this in both Draft and Sealed. And maybe it's not a first, second pick for me necessarily in Draft, but definitely a high pick. Next we have Endless Sands. This one is a land desert rare. I guess this is the rare desert. You can tap it for colorless mana, or you can pay two exile target creature you control. Pay four and sack it and tap it. And you get to return each creature card exiled with this to the battlefield under its owner's control. Um, here's the thing with lands like this I want to point out. I mean, they feel like just plain upside. Like, I can just make this part of my mana base. That's true and limited for some decks, but not all, right? Because if you start to go deep with colors, maybe you're playing three colors or something, you can't necessarily afford to put a land in there that's not going to help your color consistency. If that's the case and you still really want to play this, it has to take up a spell spot. And is this worthy of taking up a spell spot? Probably not. It does some good things. We'll talk about those. Now, if I'm 
in a two color deck and I'm looking at playing maybe nine forests and eight mountains or something and I decide you know what I can easily get away with eight and eight and then just play this as my 17th land well then yeah it's total upside and there's no reason not to play it at that point what it does for you is when you put this in play it protects your creatures or the very least signals to your opponent that hey if you are going to try to disrupt me it's not going to be a destruction spell it's going to be a tempo spell which sometimes is still good enough <laughs> so for example you have a creature out you have your mana up your two mana your opponent has that removal spell they have a decision to make do they wait until maybe you tap out or something like that or are they still in a commanding lead if they just go ahead and destroy that creature let you tap this and your two mana and hide it away in the endless sands and then next time you untap you have to pay four mana probably take a lot of your turn off to get the creature back sacrifice the endless sand so that's gone now yeah it's still a pretty big tempo play it's still hurting you quite a bit if that's the situation. So like I said, it's not something that is super exciting for me, but there are ways to abuse this at times. For example, enters the battlefield effects. You can uh, perhaps kind of double up on them sometimes or combine a couple of them together if you can kind of stow away a couple of creatures. I mean, there's good things this card does, but again, it just requires a lot of setup and it's not going to help you if you're behind. And that's my only issue with it. Again, if your mana base is fine and you're comfortable with it in both sealed or draft, then yeah, you know what? Run it as one of your land cards and it's just going to be great for you. In that case, it's just upside. But yeah, I'm not going to pick this very high when it comes to draft. And I don't really see it falling into, say, standard or anything like that. Not at this point. Having said that, those are the cards for today. We saw some interesting ones today. I mean, again, some of them were more for the limited game, and that's fine. You need to have a lot of those cards in the set. Tomorrow, we'll do another video. We'll recap everything that comes out over the next 24 hours. Then on Friday, we'll begin that full set review. So until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe, and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.